Welcome to Trinity Pacific Church. And I ask that you join us in singing, Help Me to Be Holy, as we study on what it means to be holy this week. Father God, we thank you that you are there for us all the time. We can come into your holy presence just as we are. We can come whenever we're ready and you long for us to come to you. And so right now we ask that you would remove everything that is distracting and help us focus only, only on your word only on what you are saying to each of us through the power of the Holy Spirit, that we would be transformed, that we would not be the same people who have come into this place, but that we would be renewed by your spirit as we leave this place. We thank you for this privilege and pray this in the precious and powerful name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, by whose blood we have been redeemed. Amen. Our sermon series is a very simple one. Welcome to Trinity Pacific Church. And that, of course, takes us to all kinds of places. And one of the places that it takes us is to the people that have come. And so I'm going to invite um, two of us to briefly share how they came. And I'm wondering, Maxine, if I should come to where you are in order to have you share. Okay. Bear with us, no, just stay sitting. Okay. So how did you come? How did I come? Okay. I was born to a Jewish family. Okay, how did you come to Trinity Pacific Church? To make a long story short, I was going to Pathways Clubhouse. No, this way, for a while, I've been tested for my religion. I couldn't understand that. Didn't do anything about it. And when I talked to somebody, they said I'd been tested for my religion. So, Make a story short, I moved to Vancouver, actually to Richmond, and in my complex, we were doing Bible study. And I met Pastor Frank at Pathways Clubhouse. He, sat, he graciously sat at my table for lunch. 
we started talking. Next thing he did, he came to um, our Bible studies at Alexander Court. Then he asked us, Glenn, Gloria, and me, to join the church. We came. We didn't know what we were expecting. And the love here, the fellowship, it, it, um, it's very welcoming. And that's how I start, came to church. And I love TPC because it's holy, it's uh, comfortable. I feel safe here, but I also feel um, that Jesus is with me here. Wonderful. Thank you, Maxine. Thank you. Thank you for sharing. I'm wondering, Don, if I could invite you to briefly share how you came to Trinity Pacific Church. Absolutely. Good morning, everybody. Uh, good morning. Um, Donna and I had been uh, uh, looking for a church here in uh, Richmond for quite a while, and we'd been visiting around and seeing lots of different churches. And one day, an old friend of mine from work, Gord, uh, who plays trumpet and piano here uh, quite often, um, he, uh, uh, he mentioned to me that he had met, he'd had a, a, an orchestra rehearsal one night, and they'd had a guest uh, conductor, and he says, this guy's a pastor at a church in Richmond where you live. And he was really amazing. You should go check him out. He says, I'm playing uh, some stuff for Advent. I'm playing trumpet for Advent uh, this year. And so this would be the first week of December, uh, 2019. And he said, I'm playing uh, uh, some, some, some music and you know, you guys should come and check it out. And so of course we did and we came and the first week we came and we found it very welcoming. We liked everybody here. It was such a friendly and lovely place to be. And uh, so then we came back the next week and we brought some friends and they thought the same thing. They thought it was a wonderful place to be and that, uh, uh, that they really enjoyed it. And uh, it was a great finding. And we just kind of felt like we had landed safely somewhere here in Richmond and that we had a place that we could call home. And that's how we came to be here. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. And of course, that's the one perspective, right? That's the perspective that we see. The other perspective that we need to see is God's perspective, right? That he knows what we need and he will bring us to the place that will help us in our need. And so we praise the Lord that we can be that place right here at Trinity Pacific uh, for so many people for so many years already. And we trust that he will keep these doors open and uh, allow us to minister to many more and possibly multiply to, um, to uh, plant other churches. So uh, it's a blessing to be here. Um, I've also got my story, but I'll be sharing that for uh, a later Sunday. Uh, keep tuned, keep coming, and invite your friends. Part of who we are has to do with our roots. And of course, um, part of who I am as a person goes way, 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 way back. Um, it's not just my parents, but it's also my grandparents and their parents and all kinds of stuff that, um, that have made me who I am. But I didn't recognize that until I began to hear these stories from my uncles and aunts and from others. And lo and behold, my roots go back to the Ukraine. I don't look Ukrainian, I don't speak Ukrainian, but it goes back a long time. As a matter of fact, not even all that long because my parents were still born in the Ukraine and before them, generations were born in, in the Ukraine. So yeah, that changes the way I hear the news, right? That changes the way I interact with people. And here at Trinity Pacific Church, we've come to recognize that our, our roots go back to the holy move, holiness movement in the 19th century. And so what we are most interested is in what the Bible says about that. Um, yeah, there's lots of preaching and all kinds of stuff going on. As a matter of fact, if we try and do all the historical research, we'll probably get a little confused. And so coming back to the Bible, keeps things simple. That was the root 
of the um, holiness movement anyways, because they felt that things were just being too bureaucratic in the churches and they needed to come back to the Bible, come back to Jesus and be filled with the Holy Spirit, hence the term um, holiness movement. We began this uh, sermon series on July the 3rd by getting a deeper understanding of what it means that God is holy. That's the place we need to start. We need to always start with God, and we'll be coming back to that. And then we followed up a week later by exploring how God makes us holy. Now, that's a very challenging concept because this is in the spiritual realm, and it's not something that we physically see, although we do physically experience that. And today we want to talk about holiness as both a position and a process. And don't worry if you don't understand this now. I trust that as we go through the scriptures, you'll come to a better understanding of what this means. When God makes us holy, something amazing happens. In Leviticus 20, verse 7, the Bible says, I am the Lord who makes you holy. Okay, we don't all of a sudden wake up one day and we're holy. We don't go a certain place and then become her holy. It is the Lord who makes us holy. And that's so important. God is always the one who initiates God created the heavens, the earth, the sea, and everything in them. Since Adam and Eve sinned by eating the forbidden fruit, all of us are born in sin, and all of us grew up living in sin. Praise the Lord that that is not the end of the story. Can I say that again? That is the reality we live in, but it's not the end of the story. John 3, 16 and 17 reads, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. God created the universe. Mankind has messed it up. God creates a plan of salvation and sends his son into this messed up world. The same concept applies to holiness. God is holy. Only he can make us holy, but God will never force his holiness on anyone. As a matter of fact, after reaching out to each one of us, he tells us what we need to do on our part to be made holy. This is what the Bible calls consecration. Now, sometimes we have these big, long words, <laughs> uh, salvation, consecration, and all kinds of other Asians. Um, but don't worry. As we explore what the scriptures say, I'm pretty sure you'll get an understanding of what that means. So let's begin in the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, consecration involves washing and cleansing oneself. In Exodus 19, verse 10, we read, The Lord said to Moses, Go to the people and consecrate them today and tomorrow. Have them wash their clothes. Okay, so... This is a concept that is very important. This is God saying how we must do it. It's not us coming up with a great idea. No, he literally tells us what to do. And now we come to the New Testament. The New Testament washing of our clothes is somewhat different. There's a connection, but there's also a difference. Listen to what we read in Revelation 7 verse 14. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. How can we wash our robes and make them white in the blood of the Lamb? I don't even see too many people wearing robes today. Even I don't wear a robe. But that's not the point. This is 
spiritual language that we have to understand in the biblical context. Robes are the outward sign of an inward reality. Let me say that again. Robes are the outward sign of an inward reality and robes in the biblical sense are visible in the spiritual realm, but not necessarily in the physical realm. Isaiah 64 verse six tells us, all of us have become like one who is unclean. All of our righteous acts are like filthy rags. In other words, on our own living the everyday life of someone who has not yet surrendered their life to Christ, we read that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. That's the inside reality reflected by the filthy rags on the outside that Isaiah is talking about. The only way to wash them white is have them cleansed by the blood of the lamb. And now, Allow me to translate this biblical language that sometimes even sounds offensive to us, right? It even sounded offensive to the Romans. The Romans said, oh, they always sacrifice to this Jesus guy, and, and they're talking about blood all the time. Well, yes, they talk about the blood, but they're talking about the blood of the Lamb of God that was shed at the cross of Calvary once and for all for the sins of the world. And the Romans didn't understand that. They knew what blood was all about, but they didn't connect the spiritual significance. First, we need to recognize that we are sinners. What we wear as sinners is filthy rags. We need forgiveness and cleansing. Then we need to thank God that Jesus died on the cross to pay the price for our sins. In other words, cleansing doesn't just happen when we go to the water and, and do the soap thing. Spiritual cleansing can only happen when the blood of Christ washes us clean. And then we need to confess our sins and ask God to forgive us. Because the price Jesus paid for our sins was paid with his blood. Let me explain that a little bit. Because sin deserves death, Jesus' death on the cross by shedding his blood paid the price for our sins. And that is what cleanses and forgives us. Ephesians 1 verse 7 says, in him, in Jesus, we have redemption through his blood. The forgiveness of sins. Can you see that connection? The blood, the forgiveness. In accordance with the riches of God's grace. Yes, this is God's grace. We don't deserve it. Grace is always undeserved. Hebrews 9.22 tells us, in fact, the law requires that nearly everything be cleansed with blood, and without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. Let me unpack that for you just a little bit. He says almost everything is cleansed by blood because there are vessels and certain things that are cleansed with water. You don't need to cleanse pots and pans with blood, right? But they don't need forgiveness. Those are items that we use that need to be cleansed. Every one who needs forgiveness needs the shedding of blood. This is what Jesus has done for us. Praise the Lord. We talked about that last week when we looked at um, Hebrews chapter 10. And so I'm going to wrap all of this up for us in a simple prayer. The first thing we need to do to respond to the Lord with knowing that these truths is admit that we are sinners and we are in need of forgiveness and cleansing. I invite you to pray with me. Father in heaven, we thank you so much that we don't need to hide from you. You know of all the things that make us uncomfortable. You know 
of the anxieties, the fears, and, and all the mess that we're in, you know far better than we do. And so we thank you for opening eyes to that, our eyes to that reality, recognizing that we are sinners in need of a savior and we ask you to forgive us. We thank you for sending your son Jesus to the cross to pay the price for our sins. And would you now apply that to each of us? that you would wash us with the blood of Jesus, that we would be cleansed and forgiven of all our sins, set free from the past in order to come to you in truth and in holiness. We pray this in the precious name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. That's the first step. The second step is to invite Jesus into our hearts. John 1 verse 12 tells us, yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. This receiving is so important. In order to receive Jesus, we need to open the door of our hearts. Again, this is a spiritual reality that we don't see, but when we actually do this in prayer, it really happens. Our hearts actually do open. In Revelation 3.20, Jesus says, Here I am. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in. Again, this is a beautiful spiritual reality that is available to everyone. Everyone is invited to ask Jesus to move in by opening their hearts and saying, Lord Jesus, will you please move in? Notice that again, it's Jesus who makes the first move. He's the one that knocks on the door of our hearts. We didn't even know we needed a savior until Jesus knocks on the door of our hearts. But he will never kick it in. He's never gonna say, I know exactly what you need. You don't want it, but here it is. No, 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 friends. Jesus patiently waits, and he will allow us to leave the door shut if that's where we are. It is when we receive Jesus into our lives, when we open the door of our hearts and invite him in that we are born again and become children of God. This is so amazing. This is something that Nicodemus couldn't wrap his head around, but this is not something for our heads. This is something for our hearts. Remember that we're not opening our heads to Jesus. We're opening our hearts to Jesus. Here's the connection to where we just came from. Just because we have been forgiven does not mean that we are born again. Let me say that again. Just because we have been forgiven, just because our sins have been forgiven, doesn't mean we are born again. But before Jesus enters our lives, we must first remove those filthy rags, be cleansed by his blood, and be forgiven. And so now we need to receive Jesus by inviting him into our lives through prayer. This always happens through prayer. Why does it happen through prayer? Because that's the way God has ordained it. Prayer allows us to enter into his throne room and make that personal sacrifice. The Bible tells us in Romans 12 verse two, present 12 verse one, I'm sorry, Present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and perfect. And so this is what we do by prayer. And if you would like to invite Jesus into your heart, I invite you to pray with me. Father in heaven, we thank you so much that we don't need to walk around in the dark. We don't need to hope to somehow um, come to heaven when we die you actually show us through your word 
how to do this. And we recognize that Jesus is your son. Jesus is the savior of the world and he is knocking at the door of our hearts. How beautiful to know that he is the one that's knocking. And now Lord Jesus, we invite you in. We open the door of our hearts. We thank you that you are willing to come in. We're not worthy, but you actually long to come in and transform us. Thank you for dying on the, sin, on the, on the cross for our sins and for allowing us to receive you into our lives, be transformed, and thereby become children of God. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now we are ready to ask God to fill us with the Holy Spirit. God is holy, and only he can make us holy. And Jesus tells us in Luke 11, verse 9, ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be opened to you. And for some of us, that sounds like a blank check. Just fill in the blank, and there you go, right? But we need to put that in the context. And so at the end of that passage, in verse 13, we read the following. following. If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, and these children can be anyone, how much more will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? In John 3, 5 to 6, Jesus says, Very truly I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of water and the Spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but Spirit gives birth to Spirit. And so the question we have today is, are you ready to ask our loving Father in heaven to fill you with the Holy Spirit. And if you are, please join me in prayer. Father, we thank you so much for your spirit. Your spirit was there hovering over the waters when creation took place. Your spirit has filled so many saints in the Old Testament and the New Testament and throughout history. And Jesus tells us that we need your spirit and not even try to undertake anything until we have been filled with your power from on high. And so, Father, having been forgiven, having received Jesus into our lives, we also ask that you fill us with your Holy Spirit, that you allow us to have the power to follow Jesus and do your will through the Holy Spirit. And we pray this with great thanksgiving in the name of Jesus Christ, your son. Amen. Now, all who have asked for and received the Holy Spirit can enter the kingdom of God. Remember, this is what Jesus says, right? Unless you've been born of flesh and of the spirit, you cannot enter the kingdom of God. This is because the kingdom of God is a holy place. Let me say that again. These are biblical truths that we sometimes have a hard time wrapping our minds around. The kingdom of God is a holy place. And because we are children born of God, we are as holy as he is. And that is why the Bible calls believers saints. Sinners cannot be holy. Remember that, right? Sinners have filthy rags and they cannot be holy. Only saints can be holy. And the biblical word for saints is holy ones. In the Old Testament Hebrew, we have kadoshim. Kadosh is holy. Kadoshim is holy ones. In the New Testament, we have Hagios, Hagios is holy, and Hagios is holy ones. Listen to how the Apostle Paul addresses believers in his letters. Romans 1 verse 7, to all those in Rome who are loved by God and called to be holy ones. 
to the church of God that is in Corinth with all the holy ones who are in the whole of Achaia, to the holy ones who are in Ephesus and are faithful in Christ Jesus, to all the holy ones in Christ Jesus who are at Philippi with the overseers and deacons. It goes on and on. This is the reality. Paul is writing to believers. Paul is writing to holy ones. And normally, according to the King James, we translate this as saints. <laughs> but literally, it means holy ones. And so if you have prayed to be forgiven and cleansed by the blood of Jesus, if you have prayed to receive Jesus in your heart, if you have prayed to be filled with the Holy Spirit, then you have been born again, born of the Spirit, because now you have been born of God. You are a saint. You are a holy one. Now, friends, we all know for certain that we are a child of God because we have deliberately wanted Jesus to come into our lives. This is not just something that happens to us. It is something that we long for and we ask. We know exactly what we're doing. And that's why no one else can do it for us. I can't zap somebody into believing in Jesus. I can't zap somebody to becoming a Christian. Oh, wouldn't that be wonderful? Oh, that would be great, but it doesn't work that way. We only have first generation followers of Christ because everyone needs to choose and want to ask in prayer to receive Jesus. And once this inner transformation has taken place, we realize that we are no longer the same person. Everyone here who has experienced being born again knows that afterwards we look at ourselves and say, hey, something's changed. I'm not the same person. We just um, sang the song, he touched me, oh, he touched me. And oh, the joy that fills my soul, something happened. And now I, no, I know, I know, I know, I know he touched me. There's no shadow of a doubt. For those of us who are followers of a Christ, that this actually happened. When God makes you holy, you know that God has done it. And now that God has made us holy, let us move on to what he now expects us to do. In Leviticus 11, 44a, God says, I am the Lord your God. Consecrate yourselves and be holy because I am holy. We've talked about what it means to consecrate ourselves, and that's the way this begins. First, we need to be cleansed through forgiveness, then ask Jesus to move in and be filled with the Holy Spirit. When all of this happens, we are made holy by God. The Bible tells us to be holy. And in Leviticus 44, uh, 11, 44b, it goes on to say, do not make yourselves unclean by any creature that moves along the ground. In other words, there are things we shouldn't do when we are holy. We shouldn't do things that make us unclean. Now, the book of Leviticus has a lot of laws and regulations of things not to do. Thou shalt not, and it goes on and on. And that was the old covenant, right? Absolutely. And praise the Lord, Jesus has fulfilled the law, and we don't have to even memorize those 613 laws, as our Jewish friends do. But now we need to apply that same principle into being followers of Christ. Followers of Christ are also called to be holy and not do things that will make us unclean. In other words, the Bible tells us that we can actually lose our holiness by what we do or neglect to do. 
The negative command here is complemented by a positive command in Le Leviticus 20. Consecrate yourselves and be holy because I am the Lord your God. Now comes the positive command. Keep my decrees and follow them. I am the Lord who makes you holy. When God makes us holy, we also have a responsibility to be holy and stay holy. Jesus tells us to enter through the narrow gate. For wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction, and many enter through it. But small is the gate, or narrow is the gate, and narrow the road that leads to life. And only a few find it. Once we've entered the narrow gate, we need to stay on the narrow path that leads to life. Remember King Saul, he was anointed. He was filled with the Holy Spirit. Everyone noticed that he was a different person, but he chose to disobey the Lord. And as a result, the Holy Spirit was taken away from him. When King David sinned, he was afraid that God would take the Holy Spirit from him as well. This is what the Bible calls the fear of the Lord. King David had a fear of the Lord. He said, take not your Holy Spirit from me. I know that I have sinned and deserve your wrath, but please will you forgive me? I want to come back to that holiness. I want to come back to that wonderful relationship with you. Moses tells us, the, tells the people of Israel in Deuteronomy 10, what does the Lord your God ask of you? But to fear the Lord your God, to walk in obedience to him, to love him, to serve the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, and to observe the Lord's commands and decrees that I am giving you today for your own good. Samuel tells the people in 1 Samuel 12, if you will fear the Lord and serve him and obey his voice and not rebel against the commandments of the Lord, and if both you and the king who reigns over you will follow the Lord your God, it will be well. The book of Proverbs has a lot to say about the fear of the Lord, and I'm just going to quote a few verses. Proverbs 1, verse 7, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Fools despise wisdom and destruction. Proverbs 8, 13, the fear of the Lord is hatred of evil. Oh, let's pause there for a moment. The fear of the Lord is hatred of evil. Better is a little with the fear of the Lord than great treasure and trouble with it. Proverbs 15, verse 16. Better is a little with fear of the Lord. Proverbs 19, 23 says, the fear of the Lord leads to life. <laughs> Praise God. And whoever has it, rest satisfied. You will not be visited by harm. In other words, we have the fear of the Lord so that we will not want to do or say anything that could make us unclean or separate us from God. This should constantly keep us on our toes. Perhaps another way of saying what we've learned so far is that holiness is both, both position and process. Holiness first needs to be given to us by God. And that happens when we are born again. And that's what we call positional holiness. We may not feel holy, but we are holy. It is because God has made us holy that we are called saints. We are called holy ones. Followers of Christ are not called saints because they do good things. Let me say that again. Followers of Christ are not saints because they do good things. They are only called saints because they have entered the narrow gate and have been made holy. Only those who have Jesus living in them are holy. And that's what the Bible calls holy ones, saints. On the other hand, we are called to be holy. This is only for those who have been made holy. 
And this is what we call progressive holiness. In other words, only those who have been born again are called to be holy. We can't and don't have the right to command holiness to everyone in society. This is a big problem in the Western world because we would like to have laws that command people to be holy. <laughs> the Jewish religion likes to have laws that command people to be holy and they call them mitzvot, right? The Muslim, the Islamic religion has laws that commands people to be holy. But for us, we first need to be made holy. This is something that does not exist in the other religions. By receiving Jesus, by becoming children of God, and then we want, we long to be made holy. We long to move into this process of progressive holiness because we long to come closer to Jesus. We long to do the Father's will. Nobody has to force us to do that. Nobody has to say, this is what you need to do. No, because when we have a living relationship with the Father in heaven, we want to serve him. We want to do his will. It's a process of learning not to do or say things that will make us unclean and doing the things God wants us to do. So one is the not and one is the do. I'm just going to pause here and remind us all, and some of you will be able to resonate with this. When someone wants to stop addictive behavior. That is a decision. That is something that is made very, very clearly. I know that this has been the motiv motivating factor in my life. It's not good and I need to stop. And one of the things that needs to happen is no more go to places where that addictive behavior takes place, where we get sucked in. We have to say no to that, and we have to say yes to healthy places, to safe places, to those places that will keep us away from the addiction we were once struggling with. When we are born again, we are still in our old bodies of flesh. We have been made alive with Christ, but we need to learn to put to death whatever belongs to our earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry, according to Colossians 3 verse 5. This is hard work, but we do have divine power to destroy strongholds. Learning to use this power that is available to us and destroying those strongholds one by one by one is a process. It doesn't happen immediately, but it needs to happen. Praise the Lord that the Holy Spirit is our guide in this. He gently puts a light on things that we need to stop doing or we need to begin embracing. And so for today, the most important thing is to know who we are. And we talk about a lot of identity and the beta course has to do with identity. And so today we need to clearly ask ourselves if I'm still a sinner. And if I'm still a sinner, I need to come to Jesus. I need to be forgiven. I need to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And then I can enter the narrow gate and begin the journey of holiness. So that's the first question. If you're a sinner, 
come to Jesus, which would be the next slide. If you're a saint, if Jesus lives in you and you can say greater is the one who lives in me than the one who's in the world, then we can come and ask forgiveness for when we've said or done things displeasing to God and move forward by avoiding the bad and committing to doing the will of God in all things. Join me in prayer, if you will. Father in heaven, we thank you so much that you make the first step. You are the one who sent Jesus into this world to live as one of us and yet be without sin, be tempted in all things, knowing exactly what we're going through, experiencing excruciating pain for our sake. So that by his stripes, we would be healed. By his blood, we can be forgiven and set free from our sins. Father, we thank you for the privilege of coming to you and asking you to forgive us and wash us clean. We thank you that Jesus is the one who knocks at the door of our hearts and that we have the privilege of opening our hearts and saying, come Lord Jesus, will you move in? Will you transform me? And thank you for the Holy Spirit, your gift. <laughs> and we can ask for as well. We ask to receive the Holy Spirit and be filled with your power to navigate all the challenges of this life in your strength. Because your word says your strength is made perfect in our weakness. And Father, we also thank you that as we walk with Jesus, as we recognize that you have made us holy ones, we sometimes do stumble and fall. We sometimes do say things that we shouldn't have or neglect to do things that we should have. And we ask your forgiveness. We ask that you would also wash us clean by the blood of the Lamb of God. Wash our robes to be white so that our relationship with you would be renewed and that we would continue to grow in our relationship with you, destroying the things that are not pleasing to you and reaching out and receiving the things that are from you. We thank you that this is a joyful process. This is not a process of judgment. This is a process of blessing. And so with great gratitude, we thank you for this privilege in Jesus' name. Amen. Mm -hmm.